Yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, so, Mani Bhushan Prabhuji, so I'll start the session, I'll continue. Mani Krishna, just I will welcome everybody buddy, on behalf of Kanya Dev. Welcome you all for today's session. Especially we are uh, very fortunate to have with us today. His grace Madan Sundar Prabhuji. We will be continuing the Chitra Kedu. Chitra Kedu life story of futility of material aspirations. Yesterday it was very wonderfully explained the first part. Today we are going to listen to the second part of the session. So on behalf of all Kanya Desh devotees, please welcome Prabhuji by chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra three times. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you everyone. And thank you for joining us for another session on Chittuketu Maharaj's story from Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> so I'll just share the notes that we had uh, put forward yesterday. So we are the second uh, session on this Chittuketu Maharaj story. So before we get into the actual scenario of the situation today, I just want to start with this beautiful verse uh, from Srimad Bhavatam, first, first canto, first chapter, second verse, which kind of establishes what is the purpose and aim of Srimad Bhavatam. Uh, unlike any other literature, uh, other literatures, even Vedic literatures, Srimad Bhavatam does not beat around the bush. Srimad Bhavatam is very specific and very clear about its objective and objective is to help awaken our Krishna consciousness, to help us understand who we are, what is our relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and what are our duties, the function in that relationship. What is this material creation and how we relate to the material creation? Everything is very clearly explained in Srimad Bhagavatam without any ambiguity. And similarly today, uh, when we discuss about Chitaketu's Maha's situation after the demise of his son, that's where we're going to see something very straightforward, uh, you know, instructions uh, given by Narada Muni and Angira Muni. So before we get into that, I thought it would be nice for, uh, you know, just align our consciousness with what we are reading here, what we are studying and what's the purpose and what's the aim of Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, because we are referring this Srimad Bhagavatam for our discussion. So this is a verse that I was saying from first canto, first chapter, second verse. Dharma prochit ketavat paramo nirmasaranam satam Vetyam vastavam atravastu shivadam Tapatrayanamulanam Shemat bhagvate mahamuni krite Kimva pare rishwaraha Satyo hritya baruta te atrakitibhi Sushuru the essence of this verse, maybe we can read the translation, translation by Srila Prabhupada for that purpose. So I'll read out the translation and just give you a one line essence of this verse. Uh, translation is as follows. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable. Raise the screen. Yeah, which is understandable by those devotees who are, who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold mysteries. And this beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadev in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need for any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The point is, Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, as I said in the beginning, the goal is very clear, and that is to establish pure dharma. 
And what is the definition of pure dharma or dharma in, uh, in essence is further explained in first canto where it is mentioned uh, in essence, which means to establish loving relationship with the Supreme Personality God and understanding our nature, understanding who Supreme Personality God it is, that is what is the aim or the purpose of dharma. So that is what Srimad Bhagavatam is aimed at. And in this context, uh, within this Srimad Bhagavatam, comprising of 18,000 verses, in the sixth canto, there is a story of Chitraketu Maharaj, which is mentioned. So yesterday I had given a background of how and why the story is placed in the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. But today we'll discuss more into the, we'll look more into the details of the story. So we saw yesterday how Chitraketu Maharaj, the king of the whole world, had everything with him that an ordinary man or anyone can even dream of. Yet he was miserable. And why was he miserable? Because his one desire was not fulfilled. And his that one desire was to have a son so that his dynasty could continue. Which according to Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha principle, uh, the Purushartha, what is called as technically, of course, it is important to have a son, as I said yesterday, to perform final rites, to perform Shraddha ceremony and so forth. So the uh, ancestors, uh, you know, they can enjoy their life in heavenly planets. They could be taken care by the Shah of the Seren. So our Chitaketu And he's worried, if I don't have a son, then what's going to happen to my future uh, destination once I leave my this particular body. Hare Krishna, is the, is the sound okay? All of you able to hear it properly? Yes, Roji, it's okay. Yes, can, okay. You can hear. I just, yeah, I just saw some internet issue here. Okay, great. So yes, so Chitra Ketu Maharaj, uh, just one desire was not fulfilled. Uh, actually, we'll see how Prabhupada writes in, uh, in one of the purpose in the section destined to have a son. Nonetheless, he attempted it, tried hard for it. So because he was not destined, he couldn't have a son and he was miserable. And at that point of time, Angira Muni enters, a great personality, the direct son of Brahma, the great, great grandfather of Garga Muni and Dronachara. Yesterday we discussed the lineage of Angira Muni. He personally comes to meet Chitraketu Mahara and not even once Chitraketu. Chitraketu Mahara, Chitraketu Mahara, you look so sad. You look so distressed. Is everything okay with you? And Chitraketu Mahara immediately said, my dear great sage, you know everything. Why don't you fulfill my desire? I have only one desire, and that is I want to have a son. Angira Muni had come with an intention to enlighten Chitraketu Maharaj about spiritual subject matters. However, when Angira Muni saw that our uh, Chitraketu, the King Chitraketu, is not at all interested in it. That he did not bother him much. So when King Chitraketu Maharaj requested, please, can I have a son? Can you bless me? So uh, Angira Muni said, so be it. He blessed him and got a son, we got a son uh, through his eldest wife, Pratyuti. However, while Angira Muni was leaving the palace, he forewarned Chitraketu Maharaj. He said, your son will be the cause of your happiness and distress. Even then, Chitraketu Maharaj did not bother to ask, why? Why would he be cause of my suffering? You know, you, or we all would have met people in our preaching or in our interactions with the people outside. They always say, who has seen life after death? This is what I have got, one life, let me enjoy to the fullest. Something like that, Chitraketu Maharaj was in the consciousness. He was least bothered to even inquire why Angira Muni is saying that the sun is going to be causing attention? And what was the end result? So before meeting Angira Muni, Chitraketu Maharaj was miserable. After meeting Angira Muni, after getting his desire fulfilled from Angira Muni, Chitraketu Maharaj became more miserable. When and how? When the sun, Harsha Shoka, was poisoned by the co wives, Chitraketu Maharaj and Kitaduti could not tolerate it. And the concluding verse in the 15th chapter or the 14th chapter says, 
the chitaketu maharaj was lying like a dead body near to the body of his son and he was crying he was wailing he was like he just wanted to leave his body he couldn't believe that he lost his son that he had got in such a great difficulty so yesterday when we had discussed a section we were making we found uh, primarily made two major points the first point we made where we quoted uh, the verse from rishab dev from the fifth canto parabhavasthavat abodh jato yavan jikyasata atmatvam which means uh, when an opportunity is there for us to make spiritual inquiry if we don't do so then our life is defeated and chitaketu maharaj had that golden opportunity to inquire from sadhu but he did not take an association of sadhu for that purpose rather he wanted his material desires to be fulfilled similarly in the case of shila prabhupa there are so many incidents mentioned where people would come to shila prabhupa just to get some blessings one of a very famous incident when shila prabhupa was traveling in a train in india and one man saw prabhupa with many foreign disciples so he thought oh sadhu uh, this sadhu must be very famous must be very powerful so he brought his son young son swami ji swami ji can you please bless my child so was said well we don't give any kind of this kind of blessing that you intend to no 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 swami ji please please i know your blessings are going to be very powerful can you please bless me and my child prabhupa said immediately yes i bless you and your child that you both become like my disciples wearing saffron clothes immediately the man got shocked and ran away you know another incident uh, one another indian was pestering shila prabhupa swami ji please see my hands i know you can see that you are all powerful can you please see my uh, rekhas can you please tell me what is in my future please 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 and prabhupa said again and again sir we don't do this we teach bhagavad gita we discuss from shrimad bhagavatam we chant hari krishna but we don't do all these rituals no no swami ji you can do it please please help me and then prabhupa because he was forced prabhupa took the hand of that man and he looked at it i looked at the hand and prabhupa said oh aha disaster only suffering and that man got shocked of his life he said swami ji what are you saying and prabhupa said i see so many problems in your life swami ji what is the problem in my life and prabhupa said you are suffering from birth death old age and disease and prabhupa smashed his hand and by the time the man was literally shocked so similarly the people who are too absorbed in material consciousness just like what we just saw few examples in the case of prabhupa similarly chitaketu maharaj was so in material consciousness he failed to take an advantage of angira muni and such association are considered real and that discussion will happen today we'll see that ahead so that was the first point one is defeated without spiritual inquiry and the second point that we had discussed yesterday was we had compared the character another uh, the, the compared uh, kritatyuti with sumiti in other words there was a comparison that we had made yesterday between pious materialist represented by kritatyuti and a devotee of the lord represented by sunati sunati mother of dhruva so as you said both of them had faced crisis in the case of kritadyuti she became so upset that she began to challenge god she began to actually curse the lord she said you are inexperienced you cannot be supreme personality of god and if, if karma is superior and if this kind of injustice happened then i don't believe you exist whereas we saw in the case of a devotee uh a uh, uh, sunati where when she was insulted so severely by her co-wife suruchi and her son was so badly emotionally hurt even at that point of time she maintained a a sober composure and she told the son in fact this is right i am not loved by your father and only person who can help you and help me in the situation is our supreme father lord shri krishna hey dhruva please go and take shelter of the supreme lord Sunithi did not doubted the existence of the Lord. She didn't say, "My dear Lord, how this kind of injustice happened? What wrong have I done in my life?" You again, we might have met people. At least I have, and I'm pretty sure all of you would have met people in your preaching or interaction where people say, "I have never done anything wrong in my life. Why do I have so many problems?" Because we fail to understand that this life is not all in all. We have had many, many lives in the past, and if we don't take to Krishna consciousness seriously, and then too many lifetimes are waiting for us in future also so that's how we saw a difference between a pious materialist versus a devotee yesterday and now we begin our discussion with what happens ahead uh with our uh chitaketu maharaj and kritadyuti 
And now the discussion begins with chapter 15. So I guess rather than this short notes here, I'll open the way the ways directly. That'll be more helpful. Uh, one second, please. Six. So at this point of time, when they're suffering and complaining like this, Nad Muni and Angira Muni comes to the palace of Chitaketu Maharaj. And looking at their situation, uh, Nad Muni or Angira Muni begins to speak. So the very first thing, uh, sixth chapter, 15, sixth canto, 15th chapter, verse number two. So, all right, before I get into the subject matter, just to give you a little synopsis of what discussion is going to happen now. Uh, so now Chit, uh, Angira Muni and Narath Muni is going to speak to Chitaketu Maharaj about the temporary nature of this world. They're going to speak about how we are not the body, but a spirit soul. They're going to instruct Chitaketu Maharaj that you are not the father of the son. You are just an instrument to fulfill the karma of that child who was destined to take birth through you because of his own past karma. You're just an instrument which creates a body, but you don't create the soul. Every living entity is a tunnel part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. Uh, like this, uh, uh, Narath Muni and Gira Muni speaks to Chitaketu Maharaj. So that's the first part of discussion in this chapter. And then in the next chapter, uh, Narath Muni resurrects the Jiva. And the Jiva comes back and then Jiva begins to further speak about the temporary nature of this world. Same points, but he further begins to emphasize the same point that you are not my father or mother. I don't know in which lifetime you were my mother and father. And then there is a very beautiful discussion about the value of relationships in this world and what exactly is a true relationship. But before I get into the subject matter, all of us have been connected to ISKCON. Uh, you might have seen that in our ISKCON and within a Vaishnava culture, we don't only celebrate the appearance day, the birthday. We also celebrate the disappearance day. I remember for the first time when I was part of such ceremony where they said, today we're going to celebrate disappearance day. I was culturally shocked. I said, what is the meaning of celebrating disappearance day? Because in a according to material consciousness, death is the end of life. That's it, it's a full stop. However, according to our Vaishnava literature, according to Vedic literature, uh, according to the Vedic science, the death is not an end of life. Death is just a beginning of another journey. And in case of Krishna consciousness, those who are devotees, death is just an end of a suffering condition, which opens the way for an eternal condition back at Goloka Vrindavan where now that devotee would go back and live with the Supreme Personality of God and other devotees forever. And that's the reason in Krishna consciousness, death is equally or maybe more important even than even the appearance day, because now through that uh, act of giving up the body, the living entity has got an opportunity to go back to Godhead. So here Chittaketu Maharaj is troubled, he's tormented because he has lost his son. Again, looking from material consciousness, it is but an obvious response. Many times we see when some relatives die, how our relatives make a hue and cry about it. It's a painful event, no doubt about it. Just like Arjuna lost Abhimanyu in the battlefield, he was also hurt, he was also emotionally disturbed, but he never ever doubted and he never stopped performing his duty or service. Whereas you see in case of material consciousness, people become so disturbed just like Chitra Ketu Maharaj is, they become, at times, they become totally hopeless. Of course, their situation doesn't stay like this forever, but at least for a few days to maybe a week, they cry and they feel like as if they're gonna die and so forth. And after a month or two, they all forget what happened. And at the end of the day, the photo of the deceased person goes onto the wall. And then after six months or one year, people even don't look at the photograph of the deceased person. Is that correct or not? Is that happened in the world outside? You know, the person who dies, his photo is up onto the, the, you know, on the wall and nobody bothers anymore about it. But when the person died, it feels like such a difficult situation that we can't even tolerate it. So that's the whole thing. But our Vaishnava philosophy or the spiritual life teaches us entirely different. That's the point here. So let's continue with the discussion here. 
So the first point is, are you really his relative? And that's what our Narad Muni tells uh, in this particular verse. We are reading from 6th Canto, 15th chapter, verse number 2. So I will not read the verses because we have a couple of things to cover. Today, I'll just go with the translation and give what are the key headings for it. And in this translation, which is the second verse of the 15th chapter, 6th Canto, uh, Narad Muni is saying, Chitsuketu Maharaj, are you really related to the son that you're crying for? And the translation goes as follows. Oh, king, what relationship does a dead body for which you lament have, have with you? And what relationship do you have with him? You may say that you are now related as father and son, but do you think this relationship existed before? Or does it truly really exist now? Will it continue in the future? And uh, in other words, is this relationship that we have, mother, father, husband, wife, brother, sister, friends, is it actually a factual relationship? Or it's just something temporary? Of course, it is not false. When we call it false, that becomes a Mayavadi idea, a Mayavadi conception, which means the whole material world, the whole creation is false. No. Uh, the Vaishnava Siddhanta says it is temporary. It is not permanent. And the question would be raised ahead that now in this lifetime, maybe we have relationship with our brother, sister, mother, father. But what was our relationship with each other in our previous life? And what would be our relationship in the next life? Just imagine you go to a theater to watch a movie. Um, of course, I don't know when, when did you saw the last movie, whenever, at least if I recall back my school days, the college days, you know, at least I can, I can immediately recall when you go and watch a movie, you know, you feel like being part of the movie. You would feel like as, you know, you're one of the characters and, some, and accordingly you get emotionally moved, you become elated, you cry because the hero is crying or whatever character you relate with. But as the movie ends, the moment you come out of it, you're totally detached from the whole scenario. Have you had that experience? Maybe we can just use a little chat box to interact with yes or no. So I know this uh, subject matter is making sense. Yes or no. Have you had that experience? You have gone to watch a movie and you relate with one of the characters and you feel so absorbed in the movie. But once the movie is over, you come out of it, yeah, everything is forgotten. Nothing else makes sense now. You're back into the world. And that is what is the subject matter here where Narad Muni is saying, are you really related? Not at all. And that is what Narad Muni is trying to say. Text number three. Now, Narad Muni says, after raising the question that are you really related? In other words, these all are uh, not factual relationships. Uh, the next point Narad Muni says, hey Chitsuketu Maharaj, please try to understand. Time is all powerful. Time brings the living entities together. And with time, the living entities get separated. Let me ask this question to all of you. Uh, I'm really not sure what's the age group or what who are the audience is here. So let me just put a generic question to all of you. Uh, while growing up, up to today, we would have had many friends and maybe some enemies. Let's focus on the subject matter of friends. Uh, when we had those friends in that particular stage of life, um, maybe we felt that, oh, ye dosti kabhi nahi chodenge, kabhi nahi todenge, you know? Uh, this is a friendship I wish we could have it for the rest of our life. And probably we were very attached to that relationship. But as we grew up, as we went to college, maybe got into professional life, got married, now you don't even know where that person is. But in those days, in your school life, you felt like, oh, this friendship, I would never ever at any cost would leave it. We would remain friends forever. And now you may not even know where that person is. Of course, because of social media, maybe you are connected. I am not much connected. But has it been an experience? Have you had the scenarios in your life? So for whatever I'm going to speak here, I'm going to interact with you because these are the points which I need to know that you're able to relate to it. Okay. So I just see two, three people saying yes, or maybe others don't have an access to chat, or maybe they're just silent observers. Okay, fine. So that's the point here. Uh, I'll, I'll not access for you. I'll, I'll can access. Okay. So devotees, I'll request so that to make the subject a little palatable to all of you, relatable, it's good if we interact a little bit. Uh, otherwise, it will become a little very philosophical discussion. 
And that's the point here Nard Muni is making. He says, all king, a small particles of sand sometimes come together and are sometimes separated due to the force of the waves. The living entities who have, occupied, who have accepted metal bodies sometimes come together and are sometimes separated by the force of time. Hare Krishna. Can you allow me to mute all of you once? And please feel free to raise your hand to ask a question at any point in time if you think, no, this is what, it doesn't make sense to us. And that's the point here about the power of time. And Krishna says, Carlos, me, I am time. That's the subject matter. One second, please. Where are we? Hmm. We were reading about the time destroys. Yeah, this, yes. And now the fourth point, where the will of providence. Now Narmani says, uh, Hey Chitra Ketu Maharaj, I hope all of you are able to see the Veda base. So where Chitra Ketu Maharaj, after saying it is all time, which brings us together, he takes us apart. Now in the next verse, text number four, Chitra Ketu Maharaj, oh sorry, Narmani says to Chitra Ketu Maharaj, Please understand, it's all will of providence. You are not the controller. Very interesting verse. You know, because Chitra Ketu Maharaj had tried all his life to beget a child, but he could not. But he yet he thought that he would be able to do it. And in that context, Narad Muni says, says this particular verse. And he says, when seeds are sown in the ground, they sometimes grow into plants and sometimes do not. Sometimes the ground is not fertile and the sowing of seeds is unproductive. Similarly, sometimes a prospective father being impelled by the potency of the Supreme Lord can beget a child, but sometimes conception does not take place. Therefore, one should not lament over the artificial relationship of parenthood which is ultimately controlled by the Supreme Lord. In other words, Narmi says, Chitra Ketu Maharaj, whatever happens, happens under the purview of the direction of the Supreme Lord, based on our karmic account. Sometimes somebody could be successful in begetting a child, other time he could not be, but you aren't the decision maker or control. In other words, there's a very beautiful verse that comes in the first canto where Narmi speaks that how our happiness and distress is already predestined. We don't have to make an effort. I hope you're able to see my notes here. Let me just share it again in case. Yeah, my notes are visible. And this is a verse which Narmani says in first canto of chapter 18 verse. Tasye vahetu prayate tako vidu na labhyate yat pari and the last three lines. As far as happiness derived from sense enjoyment is considered, concerned, it can be obtained automatically in due course of time. Just as in due course of time, we obtain miseries, even though we do not desire them. So that's the subject matter here, which has been brought out. So just like we don't, none of us want distress or suffering, but it comes on its own account. Similarly, based on our karmic account, we also get happiness. Chitra Ketu Maharaj, there's nothing for which you need to make so much endeavor. And then moving forward in next verse, uh, let me see the database, yeah. And text number five, uh, yeah, we can read the purport here is interesting. And this is a purport where Srila Prabhupada writes that Chitra Ketu Maharaj was actually not destined to get a son. Although he married hundreds and thousands of wives, all of them proved to be barren. So anyways, I don't want to speak on that subject of, uh, you know, okay, maybe I can just put a point here. Uh, particularly in India, uh, there are a lot of sadhus, pandits and tantric. And sometimes people try uh, to change the course of their destiny by, you know, getting some puja and kriya done in the name of some devita so that they can get some benefit in their life. And Srila Prabhupada was entirely against all these practices. Srila Prabhupada wanted us, all of us, to be entirely dependent on the Supreme Personality of Godhead because um, if, as again, as the verse said, if misery comes according to his own God, happiness would also come, which is 
based on our karmic activities. So we don't have to make unnecessary endeavor because if we try through artificial means to change uh, the situations around us, the situations later on become more worse or more becomes more troublesome. Just like in the case of Chitra Ketu Maharaj, who is suffering far more than we, even before having a son. It was far better when he didn't have a son as compared to what is the situation now. And now in text number fifth, Narmini says, all relationships are temporary. O king, and he talks about three phases of time. O king, both you and we, your advisors, wives and ministers, as well as everything moving and not moving throughout the entire cosmos at this time are in a temporary situation. Before our birth, the situation did not exist and after birth, it will exist no longer. Therefore, our situation now is temporary, although it is not false. So that's the point as I gave an example of a movie. You go and watch a movie in a theater and when you come back, you know, you have forgotten what all you thought of. Similarly, in the dream, you know, when we go and fall asleep and when we get a dream and in dreaming state, we make certain kind of relationship, we meet with people, when we wake up, the situation is lost. Uh, that's the whole point here that Nazar is trying to make, that please open up your eyes, Chitra Ketu Maharaj, try to see you're not the body, but a spirit soul. A spirit soul has been put temporarily into this body. Now with this body, you're trying to relate with everyone. But the moment they die or you die, this relationship would have no meaning. And that's the reason Mother Kunti in first canto, when she makes a prayer, she says, you know, my dear Lord, please break the bonds of affection that I have for my sons and for the Vrishnis so that I can single pointly uh, serve you and remember you. Of course, uh, you know, when we have a relationship with each other, there is a concept of emotion, mamatham. We develop that affinity. But if we understand the subject matter that we are not the body but spirit soul, then we'll be able to rise above it. Just like Arjuna in the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I believe the second or the third reason that he gave not to fight was with whom would I enjoy my dear Lord? And Krishna said, what do you mean? My dear Lord, if I kill my own relatives, then I will have nobody to enjoy my life. And then Krishna got so upset and I told you, you are a fool, you are a rascal. What do you mean by this? Do you think this body is permanent? And then Krishna begins to speak about the nature of the soul uh, and you know the difference between soul and body. So that's what he speaks here. And then in the next verse, uh, our Narad Muni speaks about how Krishna or the Supreme Lord, text number six, is actually the creator, mentor, and destroyer. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the master and proprietor of everything is certainly not interested in the temporary cosmic manifestation. And a very beautiful analogy, just as a boy at the beach creates something in which he is not interested, the Lord keeping everything under his control causes creation, maintenance and annihilation. He creates by engaging a father to beget a son. He maintains by engaging a government or king to see the public's welfare. And he annihilates through the agents for killing such as snakes. The agents for creation, maintenance, and annihilation have no independent potency. But because of the spell of the illusionary energy, one thinks himself the creator, maintainer, and annihilator. So Chitra Ketu Maharaj, you think you are the father. And now because you have lost your son, you are so disturbed. And a very beautiful line purpose writes in the purport. We are reading the, this highlighted portion of the purport. Where Papa says, the present chaotic conditions of the world are due to the ignorance of leaders who forgot that they have been appointed to act by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I particularly mention this point because when I read this uh, particular uh, statement, uh, I felt the current situation because of the coronavirus. Uh, this is a perfect uh, statement that suits the situation that we have faced today uh, because of the ignorance of leaders who have forgotten that they're appointed by the Supreme Personality Godhead. Uh, because they have been appointed by the Lord, their duty is to consult the Lord and act accordingly. And Prabhupada writes further, the book for consultation is Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which now the leaders today consult, and everyone is thinking they are, they are the actual controller, proprietors, and enjoyers. You know, there was this devotee uh, back in Chicago, 
just like Chaturkita Maharaj is right now totally disheartened and disturbed. And Angira Muni and Aradhuni have come to open up his eyes, break the bonds of his attachments. So there was this devotee lady uh, serving in Chicago temple. She was from Europe. And she got married to an American devotee almost 15 years ago. But after getting married, they had a rough life, rough married life. It didn't work out well, but yet they both continued. And unfortunately, they could not have any child for a long, long time. After almost 10 years of waiting, they had a first son, or first child was a son. And I believe the only child, by the time I was there, I had left by then, America had come back, but they only had one child at that time. And this one child, uh, you know, husband and wife were having conflicts because the husband had become a very lukewarm devotee. Uh, he's going back to his old habits, where the mother is very staunch, very pakka devotee and having a conflict because of not having a proper support from the husband. Now they have a child. So all our affection and attention is with the child. And the child, by the blessings of the Lord, turns out to be a fantastic person, a fantastic devotee of the Lord from his childhood. So he lived for four years or around five years. So the child grew up to be five years old. I personally saw him and everyone loved the child in the community. But some, one particular day, one fine day, because of some particular disease, this five-year-old boy died prematurely. The whole community was shocked, knowing the situation of this husband and wife devotee, uh, how the wife is struggling, and wife had finally found some joy in her life because she had a son, and the son had been taken away. I remember there was talk among everyone that how people need to go and talk to her to console her. And then the day of uh, the final rites was there, when the final rites was to be performed for the son, I mean, that day, his own as Radhanath Maharaj, his own as Ramapad Maharaj, his own as our Chandramali Maharaj, and many of the many of the leaders of our movement were there, and many of our congregation leaders. I was a bachelor then, it was almost 15 years ago. And I remember, uh, you know, even Maharaj saying later on that everyone in the community thought that we need to console this lady. She's so, so heartbroken. But in fact, everyone felt that she enlivened each one of them. Uh, each of the community member and give them more faith in Krishna consciousness. And what was her uh, message to all of them? Whenever anyone met her and they tried to empathize with the situation, she said, I'm so fortunate to serve this dear devotee of the Lord because I'm convinced that my son has gone back to Godhead. And I'm so grateful that Lord gave me this opportunity to serve his dear devotee, probably this was his last life. That's the reason he came and lived for such a short while. An entirely different uh, consciousness. Chitraketu Maharaj is caught up with what's going to happen to me. And here a mother, a helpless mother, says that I'm so grateful to the Lord that he gave me an opportunity. And that is why Nadhuni is trying to tell him and help him understand, please come out of the metal consciousness. Look at the larger picture. And in text number seven, uh, he further mentions that, yes, the parents produces the body, not the soul. As from one seed, another seed is generated a king. So from one body to another body, a third body is generated. You are just the creator of the body, not of the soul. And there's a beautiful verse which comes in, let me share my notes with all of you again, which comes in uh, third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam where Kapila Muni is speaking uh, to Mother Devahuti. And he explains the science of it. And he says, Karmana deva neitrina jantu deho pupatte striya pravishta udaram pumsare ta kanashtraya. Karmana deva neitrina. On the basis of one's past activities, under the supervision of daiva, jantu means jiva, deha pupapatte. He is given a body, deha according to his past activities and under the supervision of daiva, higher powers. And then the jiva is put into the womb of a mother. How? Pumsa reta kana ashraya. Through the drop of a semen, the jiva is put into the womb of a mother. And that's how the jiva gets a body. But how does the jiva gets a body? Not because of the mother and the father, because of his previous life karmic activities and the choices and under the supervision of Daiva. According to that, all of us have got our own parents. None of us had any privilege to choose uh, what gender we want, 
none of us had any privilege to choose what mother and father, what uh, country of birth, and in fact, what species. Fortunately, all of us are in human species. If you see all around, none of the living entities had any privilege to choose. It all depends on our karma. And that's the whole point here. Uh, with this, when Nad Muni stops speaking, he has explained to him few things, and more or less the few things that he discussed to him are these key points here, which means that uh, I hope you're able to see my notes here. And these are the key notes are visible. These are the key things that Nad Muni speaks to Chitaketu Maharaj that uh, all relationships are temporary. It is time which brings us together and takes us away. It is ultimately the will of providence. Uh, we are not the doer and all relationships are temporary, which means the past, present, future like that. And the parents produces body, not a soul. After speaking this much, Chitraketu Maharaj is immediately enlightened. It's very interesting. What do you think if Angira Muni would have said the same thing to Chitraketu Maharaj before, when he was hankry for a son, how would he would have responded to these statements then? At this point of time, when Nad Muni spoke to Chitraketu, Chitraketu Maharaj says, oh, who are you two enlightened beings? You have opened my darkened eyes. What are you saying is totally true. I surrender unto you. And those two sages then introduced themselves as Narad Muni and Angira Muni. And Chitraketu is surprised. Oh, Angira Muni, you're back. And then Angira Muni says, yes, I came first time also to give you this knowledge, but you were not ready. So I did not give you, but now you were ready. So I brought Narad Muni along with me and we instructed you. So my question to all of you is here, what do you think what would have happened if Angira Muni would have spoken these things in the previous case, when Angira Muni came to meet Chitraketu Maharaj, when he was so strongly attached to the idea that I want to have a son. And why now Chitraketu Maharaj is able to understand the subject matter of who is he, what is the nature of living entity, and who is the Supreme Lord, why is he able to understand now? Any thoughts? And with that, we we'll come to the final section about resurrection and Jiva begins to speak up. Anyone would like to share their thoughts? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. I hope I have not asked something. I mean, you can just try whatever your thoughts are, what you think on the subject, how would it happen. If you want, you can unmute yourself or maybe you can type a message. Correct. Chitaketu was not receptive. Sudarshan Vasudev Prabhu. Uh, so my point is, what? why was he not receptive? What was the thing that was blocking him to receive this message then? However, now he's able to receive because Prabhupada, of course, I have not gone into other Prabhupada, but Prabhupada writes that this is what is called to be an intelligence of a preacher. He understands what is the appropriate situation and then shares the message. Mani Bhushan Krishna Prabhu says, with practical experience, only one can understand, okay? Uh, he was focusing to have a son material gain. Okay, okay. Yeah, more or less, if you see, that's the whole point here. He was too attached to his dreams, material aspirations. He wanted those material aspirations to be fulfilled. Even if Angira Muni would have shared Krishna consciousness with him, he would have used spiritual life only as a means to fulfill his material aspiration, not to get free from material aspiration. Is that making sense? Uh, let me just repeat that again. Because I've seen with my preaching here in corporate circles with communication with the youth, unless they come into a receptive stage where they're actually willing to understand, they actually have gone through suffering. When they have gone through suffering, then they are more receptive, just like Chitraketu Maharaj. But when their mind is attached to their material aspiration, and then when you give Krishna consciousness, they just try to use Krishna consciousness as a means to fulfill their, those material aspirations because they think that by practicing dharma, by doing piety, I will get a result. 
Have you had that experience where in your programs, Mani Bhushan Krishna Prabhu, people came, they stayed for a while, they had certain problems, their problems got resolved, and they also went away never to come back again to the program again. So that, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a whole point here. Uh, that's what happened. And that's the reason when Chitsuketu, a lot of people. So I hope I'm able to connect to this point with the point I'm making. And that's the whole reason why Angira Muni did not speak to him before. Because uh, before Chitsuketu would have used the Krishna consciousness only as a platform to fulfill his mental aspirations. But when his mental desires and dreams were shattered, son is lost. He was totally hopeless. And then when Krishna conscious philosophy was spoken, he was able to relate to, oh yes. So it's just like Mani Bhushan Prabhu mentioned, with practical experience only one can understand and he had undergone the practical experience. So thank you. With that, we come to a, a very beautiful discussion in the concluding section of this series. Um, can you excuse me? I'm going in a little hurry because I just want to cover certain you know, important shlokas. So I'm not going too much in details, but hopefully you're able to get it. So now we are into the 16th chapter of Sixth Canto, where there are seven eight verses spoken by Jiva. We'll just take a focus on, spend a few minutes on it. So it's 12.55. Is it okay if we go and go up to 1.10, Mani Bhushan Krishna Prabhu? Is it all right with you and the audience? I may take five, 10 minutes just to finish this discussion about what Jiva speaks. Sure, Prabhu, you can take your, your own time. No problem. 15 minutes, then no problem. Okay. Oh, sure. yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. So, now, uh, after having all this discussion, uh, Chitiketu Maharaj is enlightened and everything, yet Narayan wanted to make sure that this person had really understood the message. He didn't want to take a risk. He didn't want his student, his disciple, to have any doubts or uh, any traces of still some material aspirations lingering in their heart. Thus, Nag Muni resurrected the son. He brought the dead boy back to life. The question arises, you know, I don't want to name a religion, but one of the religions, prominent religions in the world, uh, they particularly count a lot that our teacher did a great mystic act. What mystic act? Up to three days, he got resurrected because he got resurrected after two or three days, so his Supreme Personality got it, or else he's direct son of the Lord. Okay, that's acceptable totally, but here, Narad Muni is able to resurrect a dead son, is able to bring back to life. Uh, how do we understand this? You know, how certain people have this privilege and the power? And the idea is very simple. Uh, just like, you know, we have tall booths on the highway, where you pay tall charges on the highway, uh, certain ministerial posts or certain ministers are exempted from paying toll. So when their car comes, so automatically the door opens or the gate opens and the car is allowed to pass by without paying a toll. However, ordinary citizens, they cannot bypass, they have to pay. Similarly, the great personalities like Narad Muni, Nangira Muni, they are given the privilege or the power to manipulate or to transcend some of the material laws or most of the material laws. And Nad Muni is one of the personalities who have that capacity and potential because of which he was able to transcend, not transcend, he was able to violate the laws of nature because one who has once died is died. He cannot come back to life again. But Nad Muni was able to bring back the sun back to life. So what happens once the sun comes back to life? And now something very beautiful happens. The son is brought back to life. And then Narad Muni tells to the son, Oh, son of the king, what have you done? You have left your body and you have gone to somewhere else. Please come back, wake up and understand you are the king of the whole world because after your father, you're going to be the king, accept all this opulence and enjoy your life. And the jiva had just woken up from like a deep sleep. And he does not know anyone in this whole room. Because once he died, after his death, he has already taken several births elsewhere. And suddenly, now when he have brought him back from that particular life into this life, and as we all know, as the third canto mentions, that as soon as the jiva comes out of the womb of a mother, he is covered by the Lord's external energy. 
or the influence of ignorance, and he forgets everything about his past or the previous life. So Jiva kind of wakes up and he's looking at what's going on. And Nagmuni says, hey, Jiva, this is your mother. This is your father. The father is the king of the whole world. So please enjoy your life. Don't honestly give up your body. And Jiva looks around and says, wait a second. Who is my mother and father? Text number four, Jiva Vacha. By the mystic power of Nagmuni, the living entity re-entered his dead body for a short time and spoke in reply to Nagmuni's request. He said, According to the results of my fruitive activities, I, the living being, transmigrate from one body to another, sometimes going to the species of the demigods, sometimes to the species of lower animals, sometimes among the vegetables, sometimes to the human species. Therefore, in which birth were these my mother and father? No one is actually my mother and father. How can I accept these two people as my parents? And these few verses of Jiva are very, very important. Um, here he tells, uh, none of the living entities are my mother and father. My eternal mother and father is only one. As Krishna says, so Jiva Loka, Jiva Bhuta, Sanatana. Every living entity in this world are my part and parcel. And that's what Jiva says, you're not my mother and father. I, don't, I do not belong to them. And uh, beautiful purport. I'll read out this particular paragraph from Srila Prabhupada's purport of this verse. This time, the living entity was supposed to have been the son of King Chitraketu, because according to the laws of nature, he had entered a body made by the king and queen. Just like all of us have entered the body prepared by our mother and father. Actually, however, he was not their son. Now we can translate this for us also. In other words, actually we are not the son of what we call as mother and father or the brother and we are someone's brother and sister. The living entity is the son of the Supreme Personality of Godhead because he wants to enjoy this material world. The Supreme Lord gives him a chance to enter various body. Just like Srila Prabhupada gives an example of his own son that one day, you know, his son was trying to touch the moving fan. You know, as Prabhupada told him, Abhicharan, they told him, uh, my dear son, don't do it. Your finger would be hurt. But the son was again trying to put his finger onto the moving fan. So then Prabhupada said, okay, so be it. So he switched out the fan. And when the speed of the fan became a little low, that father told the son, Abhicharan, they told the son, okay, son, now you put the finger. And as soon as he put the finger between the moving fan, tongue. And after that, he realized, oh my goodness, I should never ever put my finger into the moving fan. My father, what he said was right. Similarly, Prabhupada is making a point because Jiva, we all want to enjoy. So the Lord says, okay, go ahead, fulfill your desires. And once we realize the mistake, we would ever, ever want to come back to this world again. The living entity has no true relationship with the material body. He gets his material father. Also, he has no true relationship with the material body. He gets from his material father and mother. He is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, but he is allowed to go through different bodies. The body created by the so-called father and mother actually has nothing to do with his so-called creators. The jiva here flatly denied the Maharaj Chitraketu and his wife were his father and mother. So what is the perspective uh, of the subject in the Vaishnava community? How do we deal with it practically? Of course, fact is a fact. That's the reason before coming to the subject matter about relationship uh, between mother, father, brother, sister, I kind of quoted the verse about the aim of Srimad Bhagavatam uh, to offer us unadulterated truths, truth about our tattva, truth about our nature and the nature of the Lord and our relationship. So in Vaishnava philosophy, according to Vaishnava culture, uh, even those of us who are in our order, we don't try to uh, misuse this knowledge in a selfish means by saying that, okay, because it is mentioned in the scriptures, you're not our mother and father, I got nothing to do with you. Well, that's not the case. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not act, acted like this towards his own parents. When Mother Sachi requested Chaitanya Mahaprabhu after his taking sannyas, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, my dear mother, please forgive me at Shantipu when he was in Adrita Chari's house. Please forgive me that in, in my uh, childishness, in my maturity, 
I took this drastic step of taking sannyas and I've broken your heart. Please forgive me. If you want, I can come back. And Mother Sachi said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. It will bring about such a great insult. Your name would be spoiled. I don't want that. But can you please promise to me that you will live nearby? In those days, if a son takes sannyas, he can never go back to the town or the village where his mother and father lived. So that's the reason Chaitanya Mahaprabhu decided to make Jagannath Puri as his headquarters rather than Vrindavan. Although Chaitanya Mahaprabhu always wanted to be in Vrindavan. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no, my dear mother, because you have given this body, you have given me the training, you have given me everything. How can I be so ungrateful to you? Yes, I will serve you. But yet, it does not mean that we forget our service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. While trying to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we should also try to serve our parents in relationship to that, not against it. So sometimes, of course, when people join Brahmacharya Ashram, or maybe those who become devotees in the beginning eight days, sometimes people become a little hard-hearted towards the parents. Uh, we, had a case, we had a case two years ago where uh, one of the boys wanted to join our ashram. And uh, he told his parents that I want to join Ashram. The parents, of course, they said, no. <laughs> he, he immediately told on their face, who do you think who you are? We have no relationship. Do you think you are my mother and father? You have just given me a body. You have not done anything for me. And that body also you've given to me because of your act of sense gratification. And I've got you as a parent because of my own karma. You have no control on me. And like that, he spoke so harshly. The parents got so much hurt. That's not our culture. So the point is, we need to understand the philosophy in the right context, which means, yes, this is a truth, but we need to see this in the perspective of Vaishnava culture, that how we can still serve the parents, help them become Krishna conscious without compromising our spiritual practice. I just wanted to bring a point here, uh, just to be a little careful on the subject that, you know, what's our relationship with the mother and father? Text number five, uh, here Jiva, as I said, Jiva is going to speak more or less the same thing what Nathvani has said, that, you know, who am I, what is our relationship is all temporary. So here in text number five, he says, there is no permanent relationship in this world. Everything is temporary. Text number five, in this material world, which advances like a river that carries away the living entity, all people become friends, relatives, and enemies in due course of time. They also act neutrally. They mediate, they despise one another, and they act in many other relationships. Nonetheless, despite these various transitions, no one is permanently related. Very, very beautiful point. This and the next three verses of oh, brilliant verses, next two, three verses are analogies to establish this point. Let me ask a question to all of you. Have you had a situation where you had a friend in the past, or you had somebody who you called as a friend, but later on he became uh, your enemy. In other words, later on you became upset with him and you didn't want to do anything with him. And let's reverse the situation. There was somebody in the past uh, who you knew, who you did not like at all, but later on you became a good friend with him or her. Have you had that, all of you had that, that situation ever? Yes or no? You may just reply on the chat box. Have we had the situation? And these days, such situations are too much. You know, uh, these days, the, the rates of divorces have increased so much. You know, when they get married, the husband, the girl and a boy, they look, they feel like they're on cloud seven. They are the best couple in the world. After 10 days, they get divorced and they like, they don't know each other. You know, that's the situation around. So that is what our um, uh, Jiva is saying, that in this world, no one is permanently related. Everything is changing. And why it is changing? The idea is because of the modes. Uh, I will not go in details of it. I'll just speak what Popa writes in the puppet. If you are aware of the subject of modes of material nature very well, so then you will relate to it. Uh, we generally align with people well when we are in the same modes, which means Sattva Guna person will go well with the Sattva Guna person, Raju Guna with Raju Guna, and Tamaguna with Tamaguna. So let's say if I, and let's say Sudarshan Vasudev Prabhu here, if both of us are in Sattva Guna, or let's say we both of us, for an example, I'm saying let's go over the Rajaguna. So we may align with each other very well. And tomorrow, Sudarshan Vasudev Prabhu cultivates Satvaguna. He comes into a Satvaguna platform that he would find it too difficult to relate with me. And then our relationship would get separated. And that's the point Prabhupada makes in the puppeteer in the temporary lines. 
Therefore, one who is my friend today in association with the mode of goodness may be my enemy tomorrow in association with the modes of passion and ignorance. And because of the changing modes, which are constantly happening, and it depends on how we act in this world, that's the reason our relationship keeps changing. Sometimes we are friends, sometimes we are enemies, sometimes we like each other, sometimes we dislike each other. So point uh, which Prabhupada makes it, another point of the purpose is, uh, it's all temporary relationship as the Jiva is saying. So which means uh, our, what is that? Uh, the Jiva, uh, the Chitra Ketu Maharaj could have fairly thought that this son of mine could have been my enemy in the past life who have taken birth in this lifetime just to cause me trouble. And text number six and seven com combined together, the idea is uh, the jiva does not belong to anyone. According to his karma uh, and according to his uh, desires, he keeps accepting different, different sets of mother and father. Just like money, money doesn't belong to anyone. Money ultimately belongs to Reserve Bank of, uh, Reserve Bank of India. So, you know, let's say I have some money in my hand today and that same money would for my hand goes into the hand of someone else. When money is in my hand, I may say it belongs to me, but the fact is money does not belong to me. Money always belongs to R by I. The day Narendra Modi announced demonetization, all that 500 or 2000 bills, whatever the bills, he said, they're not valid. All that money which people thought were there became useless the next morning. Similarly, the analogy which our jiva is giving here, the jiva does not belong to anyone. According to his karma and desires, he keeps accepting different sets of parents. Hare Krishna, your sound is broken. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji, your sound is not there. Able to My hear, Prabhu? Only person, Prabhu? Only person, Prabhu, why am I able to hear? Maybe um, uh, you, your connections, maybe Manibhush Mirabhu's connection, maybe some problem. What about others? Can okay. anyone hear? Can, can anyone hear? hear? Can hear. Can hear. Shimla Madhaji can hear. Yes. Somebody else can please hear. respond. Yeah, Clear. Ambika yes, Madhaji can, can hear. Clear. Yes. Vengadesh Prabhu, yes. Mahesh Prabhu says yes. Okay. I think most of the devotees are able to hear. Okay. So here... We are on the concluding point here now. So it's a very beautiful purpose of this verse that I was saying about how money exchanges hand. Money doesn't belong to anyone. Ultimately, it belongs to RBI. Similarly, Jiva says that Jiva does not belong to anyone. He keeps on changing the set of parents in different, different lives. And the purpose is very profound, uh, where in purpose, Prabhupada brings out two important points. Uh, who is a fortunate soul? And Prabhupada quotes this famous verse from Chaitanya Charitamrit. A fortunate soul is one who could find the shelter of Guru. Because of the shelter of the Guru, he can find the seed of devotion. And then in the last point, what is the most rare thing for all of us in this world? And I guess I'll pause at this point. Um, yeah, I'll pause with this point. And the point is, now for example, uh, you know, Jiva is saying that we have had many parents, we have had many lifetimes, we have been accepting different set of parents time and again, but there is one thing which is very, very rare, and that is to find Guru in one's life, because that Guru, that Guru bona fide spiritual master actually can give us the knowledge and wisdom to realize our true nature, and that is the verse here, and which is the most rare thing in this world. Finding a set of parents is very easy, but not a Guru. Janme janme sabe pita mata pai Krishna guru nahi mile vaja hari and the transmigration of the soul through different bodies everyone in every form of life be it human animal tree or demigod gets a father and mother this is not very difficult the difficulty is to obtain a bona fide spiritual master and Krishna therefore the duty of a human being is to capture the opportunity to come in touch with Krishna's representative, the bona fide spiritual master. Under the guidance of the spiritual master, the spiritual father, one can return home back to Godhead. Apart from this, everything is temporary. The only permanent thing or eternal thing is our relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that relationship or the knowledge of relationship 
only gets awakened in the association of his bona fide representative. That's the reason initiation is said to be a second birth, which is said to be a very, very important, where, uh, you know, uh, during the time of initiation, we are given a new name. And that is what is said to be a beginning uh, of the end of our life in this temporary world. And like that, Jiva stops speaking and then Jiva disappears from there. Chitra Ketu Maharaj is totally convinced. Narad Muni gives the mantra to Chitra Ketu Maharaj to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Chitra Ketu Maharaj is completely detached from all his material affinities. Uh, he has had a first-hand experience of his material aspirations getting smashed to pieces and the sufferings that he got because of it. And he has understood this is all temporary, futile. I should not waste my time. I should, I should follow the advice of Narada Muni. And he renounces the kingdom, goes to the forest, performs tapasya. And in a very short time, uh, he pleases the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he gets face-to-face -face darshan of the Supreme Lord. And that is how this particular chapter ends. And Chitra Ketu Maharaj has attained the most rare jewel, that is the love of Godhead, or devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by the mercy of Narada Muni and Angira Muni. And with that, this discussion ends. Of course, the discussion continues ahead how Chitra Ketu Maharaj once met Parvati and Shivji, and he got cursed for certain reasons. That's beyond the scope of our current topic, but that's how the story goes. So in essence, in this world or in this creation, if there is anything which is, can be said as a truth, that is Supreme Personality of Godhead. And if you forget Supreme Personality of Godhead, if you forget Krishna, then everything else is temporary. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to love others. But that experience of love, we cannot have in any relationship if it is minus Krishna. Everything will become futile because everything in this world is temporary. All relationships are temporary. And that's the reason the devotees of the Lord even celebrate the disappearance day because they know that's not the end of the life. That's the beginning of an eternal life in Back to Godhead at Goloka Vrindavan. So with that, thank you so much for your kind attention and hearing me patiently. And kindly excuse me that I went some minutes over time. Uh, Hare Krishna, Jagat Guru Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Hare Bhagavad. Hare Krishna, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, very well ex explained this concept. It is very, very interesting. Prabhupada, can I ask you one small question? Yes, Prabhupada, I'll try my best in case I yeah. can. Actually, what you are telling that uh, the friends, the previous friends, especially in my life, I am ex 